here today to talk about MOOCs and the older learner. Um, I am coming from the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at UC Berkeley, and I'll talk a little bit about what the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute is. Um, we're called Ollie at Berkeley for short, and I'm also a master's candidate at UC Berkeley in the School of Public Health and in the School of Social Welfare. Um, you might be wondering what I'm doing here in design track. Um, I'm not a designer, I'm not an educator. Um, my experience with MOOCs has been at, at Ollie at Berkeley, putting them on for some older adults um, and doing blended learning. Um, but my specialty in schools and aging, and I'm specializing in the health and the welfare of older adult populations. And so I kind of come with this background um, and knowledge of working with older adults um, in many different areas of my life. So that's why I'm here. Um, so to give you a little background at Ollie at Berkeley, um, so we're a year-round program for adults aged 50 and older. Um, we offer non-credit courses, as well as lectures, special events, interest circles, and we also have research that we do. Um, the research arm consists of myself, um, Susan Hoffman, who's the executive director of Ollie at Berkeley, and then we have an advisory team that's composed of Ollie members who also tend to be retired um, UC Berkeley faculty who have experience conducting their own research. Um, and a couple of them are actually current faculty members at UC Berkeley still. Um, so there's 119 um, Ollies nationwide, and they're funded by the Bernard Osher Foundation. And we're the only ones that we're aware of that actually has this research component. Um, we, we look at research as a way for us to kind of keep um, both on the cutting edge of making sure that we're applying neuroscience findings into the classroom, as well as conducting our own research to kind of understand the learning experiences of older adults. Um, we also really strongly advocate for including um, in the research, including the voices and the experiences of healthy older adults. You know, I think so often we, we, we look at the experiences of um, you know, sick, frail, older people, and there's a really wide variety of experiences. Um, and also looking at what some of the positive aspects of aging and what older adults can add to the environment. Um, and finally, as I said, like we really strive to incorporate any research findings directly into the classroom experience so that it's, it's a really, you know, utilitarian research that we do. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about why we should pay attention to older learners. Um, the first is, I like to think of MOOCs as having a great potential as an intervention. Um, I come from a public health background and a social work background, so that might be why I have that idea. Um, but with older people especially, that continued intellectual stimulation that MOOCs can offer, as well as the opportunities for like continued social engagement, I think that's something that can be really powerful um, for all people, but especially for older learners. Um, these, you know, that continued engagement, continued intellectual stimulation can really bolster health and wellness in later ages. Um, you might be thinking, you know, there are lots of organizations that cater to seniors, and Ollie is one of them. You know, we only offer courses for people older than 50. Um, but I think that these specialized organizations kind of add to this phenomenon we see in our society of separating out older people and keeping them separate from other generations. And so I think MOOCs offer a really unique idea of ways that we can foster intergenerational learning. Um, also, in my work as a social work intern, I've had adult children turn to their aging parents in their office and go, Mom, why don't you join a senior center? Why don't you do this adult day health thing? And I'll have the senior turn to me and go, oh, those are full of old people. I don't want to go there. And so kind of this idea of that, you know, this is a way MOOCs could be a platform for people that might not want to just hang out with other older people to get this intergenerational experience. Um, another point to this, of this learning, the value of learning in older ages, um, to, to draw also from my social work, I had a client who, extremely isolated man. His wife had died, his family had no family, his friends had died, he was living alone. He came into my office and I was expecting a host of problems. Um, he had one of the most cheerful demeanors I'd ever seen. And I said, you know, what do you do with your time? What, do you, what are you doing in your house all day? And he goes, oh, I'm learning. 
He was teaching himself French and Spanish from books, and then he'd rent videos, and he'd watch the subtitles, and he'd connect the learning, and so he was learning these languages. And he said, you know, my health, I can't travel anymore. My wife's gone, and we used to travel together, but I can have the world come to me through these languages. And he was very low income, because I had said to him, you know, have you thought about taking classes, doing stuff like that? And it wasn't something that he could afford to do. And I thought, wow, like this is a guy that MOOCs could be a really interesting concept for him if he was able to kind of access the platforms and get into them. So just thinking about kind of MOOCs as, as a public health intervention is something that can really benefit a lot of people. Um, the next thing are demographics. You know, if you look around the room, it's a pretty small group that's in here. And this is typical for any time that we talk about older people. Um, it's a small world that are actually interested in working with older adults. Um, I come from the Bay Area and you know, I see the same people over and over. We're talking about 20% of the population is gonna be over 65 by 2030. The fastest, fastest growing demographic in this country is people over 85. And so this is a huge demographic and there's not a whole ton of interest or people that are focusing on this. And so there's a missed opportunity, I think, in MOOCs that we could really start focusing on older adult learners and tailoring some things to older adult learners. The next thing is risk factors. You know, I got a little bit into this as far as MOOCs is intervention. Um, but older adults are more at risk for things like depression, for social isolation, cognitive decline, you know, hearing and vision loss. And so the more that we can kind of mitigate these factors through this concept of a MOOCs intervention, and then also consider these factors when we're designing MOOCs, the more that we can make this accessible for everyone, um, and then help with these risk factors. Um, finally, there's gonna be increasing numbers of people that are homebound, and so they're unable to lose their homes to, sorry, to leave their homes. And so for those individuals, what happens? You know, what are you doing when you're at home all day and you can't go anywhere? What if you had access to a learning institutions, many learning institutions online, you knew how to use the, the technology and you could go online and you could learn and you could interact with other people. Um, it could help combat boredom and isolation, this feeling of helplessness, of not being useful anymore. Um, and so as we look at increasing numbers of people that are homebound, MOOCs could be a way to, to kind of add to people's lives. Um, there might be neurocognitive advantages to this like continued intellectual stimulation. And so if we look at the numbers for dementia, um, nearly one in three older adults dies with some form of dementia, according to the Alzheimer's Association. Um, by 2050, we're looking at 1.2 trillion in costs for Alzheimer's. Anything that we can do, even to delay the onset by a year, by months, by two years, is going to be emotional, physical, and cost savings for individuals and families in our systems. And so if we can look into ways of you know, forming an evidence base for how MOOCs could potentially be a neurocognitive intervention, I think that would be really excellent, and you can't do that unless you're looking at a population of older people. So the research that we did at Ollie at Berkeley um, was looking at two groups of individuals, um, very small numbers, right? We did qualitative research, we did participant observation, um, they were pretty informal. And so the first group was people aged 80 and older, and we were looking at them taking a MOOC on their own time and then coming into classrooms and discussing um, everything from content, but also the technology, any barriers they had, and things like that. Um, the second group, we had six people, and they were aged 50, and they also went up to their 80s. And so the profile of these individuals, um, highly educated. Most of our OLLI members have at least a BA. Uh, many of them have graduate and other professional degrees. Many of them are retired UC Berkeley faculty. Um, they're highly motivated. You know, there's been a lot of talk this conference about motivation and how to motivate learners, and older learners tend, by and large, to be people that have an intrinsic motivation because they are desiring to learn, not to get grades, not to get a certificate, not for their, to further their career, but really for the sake of learning. Um, and so, especially in this group that we studied, we're looking at groups that are very much um, motivated to take MOOCs as well. So they were all self-selected that they wanted to take MOOCs. 
Um, relatively tech savvy, everyone had computer access, internet access, people, you know, some people had a little bit of background in MOOCs, some people had no idea what they were. Um, and then the gender ratio, most lifelong learning, we're looking at 70% women, 30% men. In our experiments here, we found that it was more like 50-50. So more men seem to be interested in this concept of online learning. Um, so I just wanted to talk about the profile for a second longer and that this profile is important because if these, if the findings that we had apply to this group with like highly educated, highly motivated, if you're looking at the older adults that are most at risk for things like dementia and poor health, those are generally people with less education, less income. And so these findings can really show us kind of the holes and where we should also look further, but also saying like, if this group is having trouble, what would these other groups be doing in this case? So just really quickly, it MOOCs the over 80, so we have something that's called a fourth age salon, which is basically like we get, uh, the fourth age is another word for people over 80. And so for three years we've been putting these on and it's to help us better understand and reduce barriers amongst our older members. And so we hold, held them once a month and actually last year in the fall we dedicated four of our fourth age salons specifically to MOOCs. Um, so this is kind of, that's the course that we did, What a Plant Knows through Coursera. And then with the over 50s, same idea, but it was an actual course that people registered for. And then we had five classroom discussions and we focused on this MOOC, The History and Future of Mostly Higher Education. And that MOOC um, actually went into MOOCs. So it was sort of this meta interesting course. Um, and so, and then we had everyone talk, you know, the technicalities of the MOOC platform, people came prepared to class with their notes, content, what they thought of the teaching styles, if they had takeaways, things they would change. So we gathered a ton of qualitative data. What was the size of those groups? Yes, yeah, sure. So I can go back. So the first group had seven people, and the second group had six. And then I have, we have some transcripts and then pages and pages of, of notes that I took throughout it because there was a lot, of, a lot of qualitative data that was gathered. So small, but big. Um, so main takeaways are that, you know, we need to be thinking about these barriers that might come as a result of aging and as a result of comfort with technology, um, especially because of hearing and vision differences um, and the different ease and understanding of technology that these are things, these are special needs that we need to pay attention to so that we're mitigating those barriers instead of just saying like, oh, all right, well, here, take it or leave it, here's the platform. Um, and I think by maximizing the usability of MOOCs for older adults, we'll also benefit other groups, people with disabilities, English language learners, those who ha might have limited knowledge or experience of technology due to like lifelong access issues. So this isn't just about older adults with these changes. Um, there's pr tremendous benefits to you know, expanding our platforms to be more inclusive of older adults. Um, I think looking at how the ways that their knowledge and experience can add depth to the peer-to-peer -peer learning experience is really important. Um, we had a retired physicist who was actually like mentally fact-checking things in the MOOC as it went along. And so he'd come to class and be like, well, I don't think this was correct. And then he'd come with pages of evidence that he found and looked up. And so those sorts of like experiences, this is someone that has tons, many, many years of experience that can then add to this peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, I think also going back to that intergenerational idea, um, you know, there are younger people that can teach older people things as well. And so that experience of kind of the back and forth peer-to-peer -peer learning is really powerful. Um, I think the MOOC, the What a Plant Knows, there's one of our members who said that, you know, she connected with her biologist son-in-law over Thanksgiving dinner um, about this MOOC and they had this really great conversation. And so the ability that this learning environment and this like new knowledge allows people to connect with people in their social networks I think that's really cool for older people too, right? It gives you some common ground that you can talk about intergenerationally at family events. Um, and so, you know, we don't have the capacity at LA at Berkeley to measure direct health benefits at this time, but as I said earlier, like I think that would be a really interesting thing for someone to study on a large scale um, to see like what are cognitive benefits or health benefits or, or from, you know, taking a MOOC as an intervention. Um, 
Finally, dropouts. Um, what, five to 10% of enrollees actually complete a MOOC? It's pretty abysmal completion scores, depending on the MOOC, of course. Um, so there's been some talk at this conference around motivation, and I don't think you could find a more highly motivated group than this. Um, most of them said if it weren't for the ability to kind of vent their frustrations and have that in class time and have troubleshooting, that they probably wouldn't have completed the course. Um, so if we focus on usability and accessibility and the technology of these MOOCs, we can prevent dropouts in this group. Um, so yesterday, Sharif Halawa from Stanford was talking about his research findings um, of analyzing a big data set that was saying that you know a contributing factor to dropout, they include lack of social support, technical challenges, lack of encouragement, and lack of time. Um, if you think about it, lack of time is not going to be as big of an issue for many groups of older adults, right? They might have more time, they might be in retirement, that might not be such a big issue. And so those other contributing factors are things that MOOC platforms can control. We can't control people's time. And so if we focus on you know, this motivation as a factor, if we focus on lack of encouragement and these technical challenges, we can access this whole group with MOOCs. Um, finally, going back to that blended learning and social support. As I said, this was a really important factor. Um, you know, finding ways, there's been a lot of discussion in this conference as well of like the social aspects. And so I think that it's not necessary that it had to happen in person. I think that especially as we have other, you know, as the years pass and we have people that are more technologically savvy kind of aging, then that's gonna create a situation where we could do things like Google Hangouts and walk people through how to do that. And I think that, you know, finding ways that people can do more face-to-face -face virtual connection would be just as good in a lot of ways. I don't think that it has to happen in a classroom setting necessarily. Um, finally, content, I haven't talked much about it. Um, we found that users were mostly interested in filling in their gaps of knowledge. Our physicist was really interested in taking humanities courses. Our psychologist really wanted to get into more of the physical sciences. And so the like sheer array of MOOCs available was really exciting for them. Um, and so I think content-wise, there's no generalization I can say, um, and I don't think we should be doing that. Um, I think that mostly it's, it's usability and accessibility that are the main, the main things. Um, so this is one of our over 80 learners. Um, she had profound hearing loss, has profound hearing loss. And her feelings, MOOCs are not made for people like me. Um, so her name is Kay Patricia Cross. She goes by Pat. And she's a UC Berkeley Emeritus professor. For the last 50 years, she's been a leading scholar of adult education. Perfect candidate for a MOOC, wouldn't you think? Um, she uses her hearing aids, and she adjusted the speaker volume as high as it could go. Um, but she still had trouble following along because the fast pace of the professor. She didn't understand about how you could slow down the pace on the, using the platform. Um, we had to kind of show her, oh, you could do closed captions. Every single time she opened a new video segment, she had to take her mouse, direct it to the small little closed caption building, select it, and then click closed captions. It didn't remember her preferences. It wouldn't just play them automatically she became very frustrated. Each time she had to remember to do this, each time it would be something that would distract her and the segment would kind of pass her by. Um, she also said that the instructor used lots of hand waving and it was incredibly distracting for her, especially when it would get in the way of her mouth and then that she wouldn't always look at the camera. And so it was this issue of if the camera's not directly pointed at the mouth, she couldn't lip read. Um, and so Pat stopped taking the MOOC. <laughs> She still came to the discussions, but she said, this isn't for me. I think that's, that's a huge loss. Um, so, you know, I think that if we had some of these, in, in our Ollie classrooms, we have a hearing loop that, so people with hearing aids can loop in. We have microphones that are required. We educate our instructors about the best pedagogy for teaching to older people. And I think MOOCs can do this too. So really quickly, some universal design principles, consistent design and appearance on websites, you know, make everything kind of look the same from page to page. Pay attention to contrast levels. It's easier to read things with a dark background, light text. If you have a light text on a light background, it's gonna be hard for low vision. Um, making sites 
so you can navigate them only by keyboard. If someone has a disability where they can't easily use a mouse, you're gonna like erase them from being able to use your site if you can't get through it using a keyboard. Um, clear and large text on any slides on MOOCs and on the MOOC plat platform itself. Um, a camera with a clear view of the instructor's mouth. Um, I think MOOC platforms should include an accessibility statement stating that we are trying to make our platform more accessible. And so if you have any comments or questions or concerns, please notify us. We're concerned about your accessibility. Um, finally, when you're designing the platform and testing a MOOC out, test it for maximum usability. Think about the lowest common denominator. Think about the people that might be using this, your, the wide variety of your audience, and try to design to that. Um, these can all be found, they're from the University of Washington, so they have a, a good universal design site. Um, finally, to engage and retain older adults, I think improving demonstrations and help sections. Um, Coursera doesn't have a demonstration. They have a sort of a, like intro video and then help where you have to click each individual question. It's not super helpful because you have to go back and forth. Um, and so finding some sort of interactive um, platform to do a demo, edX has a pretty good one. Um, the other idea we had was, anyone remember this guy <laughs> from Microsoft Word? Um, having some sort of virtual MOOC assistant that as you went through, and you could turn it off for those that didn't need it, that you went through would kind of guide you and direct you, and so you would know that, hey, this, this little paperclip icon is going to be there to help me. Um, much like some of these MOOCs have been having mentoring programs, what if there was a peer guide program? So someone that might be younger and more technologically savvy could connect with someone and say, hey, if you have any trouble, let me know. Um, and finally, as I said, educating professors on the diversity of their audience. Um, final thing is thinking about building a short quiz into the registration process that asks people about any accessibility issues and then adjusting the interface for them. So then it would say, you know, oh, well, here are the solutions. Based on your quiz, here are the adjustments that we'll make. You know, does this sound good to you? Do you want more high contrast? Do you need bigger text? Do you need captions always on? And so you're, rather than making people do the work, the platform itself would be doing the work. Um, finally, we're going to be doing some more MOOC stuff at Ollie at Berkeley. We're using one from the edX platform on the science of happiness. We've had an in-person course on that already, so we're going to be comparing the evaluations of that to the kind of blended learning. Um, we're developing a MOOC on healthy aging. Um, one of our faculty members has been doing that. And then we'll be doing this presentation at the American Society on Aging Conference. So, there we go. Sorry, I went a little over time. <laughs> um, so, I have some discussion questions. Um, if, unless anyone has any questions that they want to think about, talk about. What lifelong learners like to li learn about all their lives long, like a, a tongue twist. Um, do, a lot of the talk at this conference has been about science. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious whether you found or whether other, others have found that there's a strong interest in, among certain age groups and maybe among older <coughs> learners in, in the humanities, or if that's not evident. I do know from book publishing, I mean, if you look at learning really writ large, and you look at nonfiction books that are bought, or even fiction books, or crossword puzzles, or brain teasers, or documentaries that are watched, or films that are, you know, these are, these are in effect learning moments, and people, mm -hmm. uh, museum exhibits, um, people intersect with these on a whole lot of different levels, and I think it, it's, it's interesting to know, if you know, um, uh, more about what older learners want to learn about. That's a good question. Um, so we do conduct um, some, we send out surveys basically every couple of years and we're asking about you know, people's content, um, or what they'd like for content, and it's a pretty long list. Um, it varies from year to year um, and also from generation to generation, and so there's not really like a generalization I can give. Um, I know that especially in our over 80 group, we found that people are really future focused, and so they want to know like what's coming up next, less than like history, right? Um, we found that kind of interesting too, because that's not what you would necessarily think. Um, we have these stereotypes that we have, and it's you know, 
then it totally blew us out of the water because they're really, they wanna know what's happening next. Um, I think that it varies tremendously from person to person. Um, I have some copies of our fall 2014 course catalog so you can look at some of the courses that we offer. And we do have a committee that's made up of all members and so if a faculty member has an idea for a course, they have to kind of get through the committee first. And then also, you know, we try to draw from, to, we've just included sports in our curriculum. We're trying to find ways to incorporate more men um, because of that 70%, 30%, you know, um, ratio of women to men. And so, yeah, it's, it's a hard question to answer succinctly. Um, I know, you know, if you email me, I can give you some more information on that because I don't know off the top of my head, but I can share with you just some of the um, numbers that we have from some of our, our past um, surveys. Sure. As far as the, the oh, so you know we are actual. So the in the winter 2014 course um, on the history of mostly future education, we started like a week late into that, and so but we went through synchronously as far as like asking people to complete the week the week before, and then we would have class discussion on Friday. So the new, um, each week it would come out on Monday and then we'd say, okay. I know um, at one of the kind of retirement communities where some of our members live, they did have sort of a, a focus on MOOCs and they had a discussion group around a MOOC there as well. But that was on, I'm not sure if they did it at the same time that that was running. That was something that was separate from us. But I, I think that that's a really good point of like, there are natural meeting places where people could go and have these sort of like book clubs or we have interest circles at Ollie and, and we did stress to them, you know, when we were selecting the MOOCs that it doesn't have to happen, you know, that you could do something that happened in, you know, September of 2012, a MOOC that started then and it just so happens that the ones we selected were happening at the same time. Yes. So, um, kind of like what you said that, you know, that you're going to talk about this next for um, <clears throat> older adults and your point was really well taken to me because the audience that we're looking for is corporate learners mm -hmm. and adult learners and what we're creating our MOOC for. So it would be helpful if you could say a little bit more about how you position the idea of engaging with a MOOC or even just participating in with this audience because I see it as a real kind of extreme end of marketing and positioning something that, and so it would be a little bit easier to do it with corporate learners, but it would be interesting to see how we learn, did it and said it. So they would actually participate in what you positioned them. Yeah. We did a, a MOOCs 101. Mm -hmm. um, we went through and actually went through the edX and the Coursera videos that they have. Um, we had it up on a big screen and walked everyone through. We kind of showed people of the actual MOOC we signed in, and since it had already started, we were able to kind of go in and, and show them. Um, and so Anne encouraged people, you know, they had my email address, and there was a, another Ollie member who had been assisting and, and volunteered his time for this MOOC project. Um, and they could contact us if they were at home and it was six o'clock, and they were like, I have no idea how to sign in. They could call us and we could walk them through the steps. 
Mm -hmm. They all had their own profiles, yes. Um, and I'm, I know that at least one of them had taken some MOOCs before, and so he kind of already had their, his sign-in things. I don't think we helped them necessarily with the like creation of the profiles. I think that was something that they were able to, to figure out and do. Yeah. Thank you. How big were the actual MOOCs that they joined, and did they interact mostly with each other in the MOOC, or did they interact with the other people in the MOOC? It's a good question. Um, so the MOOCs, I don't know the exact numbers. They were pretty massive. Um, the MOOC that was put on um, by Tel Aviv University on what a plant knows was like excellent. The production values were really excellent. The professor was incredibly engaging. The content was interesting. I mean, the, the one guy that had taken MOOCs before was like, this is, I've never seen a MOOC like this. You know, it was a pretty amazing MOOC for them to be doing. And so, large numbers, I mean, these were pretty, and then the history, yeah, I, I could look that up and, and find that out. I'm not sure the in who completed it versus who enrolled. Um, and then the other one was actually a very interesting, so there is a blended learning environment going on through that one in which, and this was at Duke University, I believe, um, and so they actually had the classroom instructor and she was having a class, but they were also taking the MOOC and then there were all these other groups taking the MOOC and it was about kind of the history and future of education. So it incorporated MOOCs um, and it was, again, like a, a pretty large group. Um, and then as far as the like interactive elements, we didn't get a whole lot of positive feedback about the usage of forums. Um, again, the most of the feedback was like, yeah, I know it's there, but like no one's told me the best way to use it. No one's walked me through this. I don't understand these features. I don't understand, you know, like if I post something up, who's, you know, like who sees that? Does everyone see that? There's a lot of sort of like questions. Um, and we had one member who, he actually did all of the like, there were these optional essays. He completed all of them. Never heard anything back. And so he spent all this time doing these essays and then was like, where did they go? You know, I, I, I haven't gotten any feedback. I haven't gotten any peer, anything. And so for him, that was really frustrating. Um, and so he kind of withdrew from those interactive elements after that. And he said, you know, a MOOC's not like a classroom course. Like, this is like reading a book, you know, which is frustrating, I know, for people that are designing because we want them to be interactive. Like, that's this idea is like they're, they're interactive, that it's not this passive learning. Um, but if people aren't understanding or, or don't feel like they have the proper guidance in like accessing these interactive elements, then it does sort of become this more passive. So, do you know if the MOOC has raised the forms? You know, so, or yeah, so the second MOOC did have an option, I believe, where you could pay for a certification from it or something like that. Um, our learners are not, that's, those are not motivating factors for them. Um, they. I think, if anything, to have a grade would be a deterrent for a lot of our older learners um, in terms of he wanted to get just some feedback or at least know someone was reading his essay, not, you know, get an A on it. Um, and so, because that's like, they're learning for the sake of learning rather than, you know, for a grade or for a certification. Um, although I think, you know, we've had some discussions with um, the folks over at Mozilla about badges and looking at, at badges, because that might be something that people are interested in, because then they could say, you know, at those Thanksgiving dinners, like, I got this badge, this is what I took. You know, you never know what the, you know, how people would react. Canvas at least gives you demographics of the entire class. Hmm. I mean, how many of the other people in the class were in these two age groups? Um, and mm -hmm. how they're, and certainly, um, you know, the other Absolutely. They're trying yeah. to, get, to get a certification or something like that. Yeah, and, and I would say to your point too that there, you know, I use this term older adult, but we're talking about a range of like 50 to 90. And so within that, there's these little, 
you know, differing like stages of life. And so someone that's, you know, 50 to 65, 50 to 70 might be looking for a second career, might still be doing their first career, you know, and so because of the way that we were looking at older learners and the way that we were doing it in the over 80 group, that was the feedback that we got. And so it is important to know that many of the people taking the MOOCs were, you know, in this group where they're not looking for certification or second careers. Um, but I think that that's definitely true for, for younger generations. But we don't ask people's age, and we deliberately decided not to do that. And so my question is, is for the group to see if, if you offer a pre-course survey, do you ask how old your students are? You do? I mean, Canvas asks that. I guess you can shut it off if you don't want to ask that. And of course, they don't have to fill it out. And you got the age distribution. Why did you decide not to? Because we tried, well, when we first did our survey, it was on it, and it was really, really long, and we knew people wouldn't complete the survey if it was that long. And so when we went back and looked at what questions uh, we wanted to remove, we decided that we wouldn't ask any question that wouldn't impact future iterations of the course. We only asked questions that affected our instructional design. And age just didn't, didn't come across for us as, as one of the things um, that we could adjust, because we are, we're confined to what Coursera will let us do. Hmm. Um, so, you know, sh short of editing every video twice, which was financially not possible, I'm not sure what we would have done with that information. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that, and your point is important too around surveys. People don't, if you have a really long survey, um, my thought in asking about challenges might be that if someone does have those challenges, they'd be more apt to fill it out, and so we would get that information. And I think that, you know, age might be something that would be, I think when you register for Coursera, they ask that. Um, I believe so. Um, I haven't done it in a while, but I think it's an optional question. It might be like the year you were born, um, I, I think, so don't quote me on that. Exactly, that's not yours, yeah, yeah, and so, you know, that, yeah, so I, in doing your own survey, it's gonna, you're gonna have a different data set, yeah. Okay. What challenges do you need to try to get that age demographic to participate in the course as opposed to your normal marketing courses? Sure. Um, we had some people that said they weren't interested in online learning, um, that it was not a platform that they wanted to explore, um, and some people that were incredibly like interested and passionate about it. Um, I think that a lot of people anecdotally take our courses, they might not lead with this, but it's something that we found throughout the years um, because of the social aspect of it, because their friends taking a course, because they met these people and they're going out for coffee afterwards and they know that Wednesday is gonna be this course and so they're gonna have that you know, social time. Um, MOOCs don't necessarily, people don't think about the social aspects of MOOCs. And so I think that might have been a barrier in people saying like, online learning, I don't wanna do that. You know, This is not necessarily what I'm here for. Um, I would think also you know, in, a lot of what people like about Ollie is that we have some professors and some instructors um, that are really well known and offer repeat courses. And so the thing with a MOOC is we can't offer any instructor reviews. We can't have the MOOC instructor come to our open house and talk to everyone about how important it is to join their course or why they might like it. And so people can't really see what the fit would be until they start taking the MOOC. Yeah. So why are you guys here? If anyone wanted, if I can pose a question to that, what interested you in thinking about older learners? Don't all go first. <laughs> <laughs> Over 
100 that are still being paid to do work. And, um, and I wrote it because people would come to me and say, I'm 40, I'll never get another job. Mm -hmm. like my mom's still working and she's paid. Now she's 91 and she goes to the hospital. So um, that was one reason. Another reason was because of universal design, we work a lot with uh, virtual ability and nobility on design. And if you don't know, virtual ability created a handicapped version of Second Life um, and has a lot of war veterans who are involved in Second Life, which is really interesting. And a lot of that, that universal design, wheelchair ramps, all that works to help women with strollers. Mm -hmm. It's just such a great principle. Um, and, and we do have a lot of students in the community colleges. The community college I taught at uh, had sort of an average age of 40, and I have as many 60-year-olds, and I have almost no 20-year-olds in my classes. So hmm. uh, community college is a place. And when the economy goes down, everybody goes to college. And then when it comes back up, they've acquired some skills or some certifications or something. Like that. And the MOOCs are really good. The California Virtual Campus, which is familiar with the CVP, the most popular classes are, for, are police, science, and uh, law because the police and firemen and so on have such erratic schedules that they use that. To do that. that makes they sense. Find a lot of the, the public services, which are big, and first responders are big, fast uh, communities. And there are a lot of people who say, I'm sick of working in an office, I'm going to go become a forest ranger for the, my second career. And that's where they would see. So, all those reasons. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We work for the Smithsonian, and so we have a large media outlet. And so we look at the demographics of our cable channel. You know, it's the average age of 53. We have 8 million readers to our magazine. It's an average age of 57. And when we look at, at our activity on, on the web, well, 18 to 32 year olds is about 40%. Mm -hmm. We have about 30% that are 55 and older. And so we see very interesting demographic there that has capacity with, with our media properties to really like lifelong learning. And so we're looking at what we can do to extend it into them. Great. Thanks. Yeah. I'm working on some digital training modules for public servants in developing countries. And something that we've learned about this learner group is that they bring a wealth of experience to their training. And so the digital training needs to respect their experience and knowledge um, and build it in somehow to the tone, the content, and the activities in the platform. And so I'm, I feel like this is similar um, to aging adults in that their experience is a value in the, in the learning process and there need to be some ways to bring that in. Great, thank you. I am interested in, in, um, in all the adults that because I, I work here at MIT and when we look at the demographics for some of the STEM courses, it's very heavily weighted in people pre-college and um, very young people who are sort of uh, ramping up on their first career. Um, and it just occurred to me, as some, you know, a lot of what you said is that there's this amazing um, potential for, for older adults to take courses for very different reasons mm -hmm. than people take them in their late teens and twenties. And, um, I just wanted to find out more about it so that I could maybe have a voice when we talk about it in my job. That, there's, that there are demographics that can really do it for very different reasons than what we would think the, 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 the big population, that there's this sort of long tail of people out there um, taking as well. Great, wonderful, thank you. We're actually looking at this segment as one of our targets for 2015. Um, so we're doing some research at the university to determine, you know, uh, what we can do, how we can do it. Uh, we think Open definitely has a spot, you know, with this group because of the accessibility, the self-paced, the low cost, low or no cost, which is what this group is interested mm -hmm. in. Um, so we're looking at this as a, one of our target segments. Okay, and where are you from? Kaplan University. Oh, great. Wonderful. Thanks. Uh, I'm currently working on an uh, online climate change course for lifelong learners, and it's not coming yet, but it has the potential to become one in the future. And um, since older adults um, have a target for this particular course, I just wanted to give them some design considerations that should keep in mind since it's a little bit different from the work I've done previously. 
Will you ask about their age? <laughs> 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 All right, thank you. Guys in the back? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Oprah. Uh, we work for a company called Extension Engine. We help uh, organizations implement the open edX environment. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's an interesting challenge, and it seems like similar to uh, many user experience problems we see on the web. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've seen, especially in, uh, in older people, they really like the iPad. Mm -hmm. Platform, and you know, I heard many stories about you know my, my grandmother got her first you know, sent her, her first email through an iPad. So I think this is a similar uh, kind of problem that we interested to solve in the same way. Uh, the technology seems like, especially based on what I've seen here last couple of days, the seems like the technology is a little premature for that. Uh, uh, f just because you know the UI is not there yet, the mm -hmm. customization is not there yet. Uh, but it seems like as soon as they, uh, specifically edX, but the other providers, when they open the uh, user experience for third parties to develop their own kind of platforms and, and um, applications to consume the content, that, that opens up to a lot of interesting opportunities with this population. Great. Yeah, so that's interesting too that you mentioned about um, the kind of the mobile devices and the iPads because there was one of our members who was saying that it, he was able to kind of go on his treadmill and just take his iPad there and do the MOOC and do the segments as that happened. And so I think that that's definitely like making sure that mobile platforms um, are responsive in the same way as a laptop or a, a desktop platform is definitely important for this group. Great point. Thanks. With the, let's say with this headline, um, because I'm interested in a MOOC for experts. Hmm. So and this is what I was anticipating. Older could be this kind of age range. Mm -hmm. Let's say 45 plus to uh, let's say retirement, yeah, because I sit on a as uh, professional aspect. Um, but the many learnings here as well about this, about the segmentation. So maybe the because I was wondering, fifty and older. So yeah, some I mean sometimes I think it's about the adoption of technology. So because uh, you, you mentioned a very interesting point, uh, people and technology. I mean sometimes uh, I have colleagues there between forty and uh, fifty. I think um, they are in the technology adoption of of maybe some some very so another generation. Uh, well, I have in the same cohort people who behave like uh, Gen Y or Gen mm -hmm. uh, the millenniums. So I think this is a very Im important point and, and this is what I got over the last um, 48 hours over here, that the whole development is very young. So it's about the customization, mm -hmm. it's about the definitions, it's about the segmentation in terms of different age groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and basically come back, so I'm looking on an expert, so how MOOCs basically could work for um, let's say in my background for I, uh, IATA, International Airline Association, um, with a bunch of experts, ICAO, uh, for um, big hotel groups, which still train individually um, their hotels. Mm. So I mean, I'm, I'm looking in, in, in these aspects of MOOCs. It's basically probably more community-based. Yeah, MOOCs. interesting though. And I think that's also a good point. You know, we had people who are in their early 50s, and they did, by and large, struggle less than people who are in their late 80s as a function of how long you've had access to and how early you adopted technology. It might be that, you know, for some of the 80-year-olds, this was they'd had a computer or they just got an iPhone, you know, that these were things where their, you know, a child had bought them an iPad, and so they might not have been using it quite as long. Um, and the point being that you know, in an ideal world, we'd be able to have platforms that they could also use. Um, but yeah, I think that was, that was a big difference um, and something to, to think about. Yes?
net, you know, has lost sort of the professional network that they find every day going to their job, but would be highly motivated to meet with other experts and potentially sort of almost have a second career in using the expertise in some sort of network, and then you would have someone else who just cared about the lifelong learning and the social aspect, and someone else who actually might want to mentor or provide, you know, the retired physics professor who actually might get a huge sense of motivation out of helping other students in sort of a team-based environment, you know. So this is where it kind of comes down to asking the question, it's as much about, you know, what you're looking to get out of it as it is even your age. But, you Absolutely. Know, and then, and then yeah. there's sort of just more of the technical issues around, um, you know, taking care of accessibility, which also can be independent of age as well. Absolutely. So. That's a really good point. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I just wanted to um, make a comment about the story you told about Kate Patricia Cross, mm -hmm. because it was so touching to me. It really stayed with me what you said about how she interacted with the MOOC as well as the meeting. It was fascinating to me that even though she had trouble keeping up with the MOOC, she still came to the face-to-face -face meetings. Mm -hmm. And it kind of signaled to me the power of face-to-face -face interaction. When people are talking about you know, book groups and ways of, of um, having peer um, connection just reinforces that there's something very um, effective about that. In fact, the fact that we're having a meeting, a uh, conference about MOOCs and we're choosing to do it face to face, face. is another mm -hmm. sort of indication that there's something really valuable here. That um, if we can leverage that in some way, people are talking about using you know, senior residences or other areas where people congregate. I think that really helps um, uh, with retention and, and just all aspects of education. The other thing I just wanted to um, comment on, and you just reminded me of this when you were talking about sort of people at age 50 as opposed to people at age 80 and the sort of difference where they, as far as like their tendency to be more or less comfortable with technology. This is one thing that fasc fascinates me about older populations is that we have a group of people between 60 and 80 who still remember what it was like to use a slide rule hmm. and who still remember having a manual typewriter and who still remember the first time they held a calculator in their hands. And it's such What's a- that? Yeah, really, <laughs> really, let me tell you about it. Um, so, so that group has lived in both worlds. Mm -hmm. So they, um, they're really people who have been in the, the pre and the post, and they have so many fascinating experiences to share with us around what it's like to, to exist in the world that's a technological world as opposed to a world where they existed without it. And a part of me feels that we need to mine that before they're gone. Hmm. They'll be gone in 20 years. And we will, everybody, nobody will remember what it was like before a computer. But there are people who, who do. And, and they have so many important stories to tell us. And I hope that like the Ali group sees the people they serve as a resource oh, absolutely. For, for us around learning and how mm -hmm. we interact with devices. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I and I the other thing is, you know, in terms of it would be great if we had I I know that there's probably websites and platforms and things where people could kind of um interview each other or, or like record some of those stories because I agree. I think that there's a lot of history that that's lost. Um and especially with the rapid pace that technology is changing, um it's, I, I have a 19 year old sister and there's just certain things that she's like, wait, what's that? Like, you know, like there was a time before you just had everything in a pocket on your iPhone and you had, you know, cause she's just grown up with that and it's a completely different world for her. Um, and I have no doubt that she would be able to go on a MOOC and figure it out in two seconds and be enrolled and be on the forum and, and doing all of that. Um, <clears throat> to your point too about the the face to face interactions, um, I think that's also I, I agree that that's important um, for people who can't leave their homes. Um, I think we should be leveraging and looking into more of the things like Google Hangouts so people can have that interaction because it's a very different experience than typing on a computer and seeing a list of answers to questions. If you can look into someone else's eyes, even over you know, this virtual world that we live in. And so I would really like to explore that at Ollie in this next um, MOOC kind of phase that we move into is like, what would be the differences if we were to have one class that where we met 
in a hangout instead of in the classroom and what people's takeaways and experiences with that. Because um, I think that that's definitely in finding ways that, that we can continue that idea of the face-to-face -face interaction but not necessarily having to be in the same location. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Mm -hmm. You mentioned the woman having trouble finding it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the people I know in California has an aged mother on the East Coast with real hard vision problems, and she lost the So she gives her a device that, you know, like the Kindle, you can blow up the book, but she calls to choose the book so it's still tiny, and so she can't choose a book. Yeah. And you just wonder who tested this? What did they try? They probably tested it on college-age students, age 19, you know, 18 to 22, like most of our research is done. Um, yeah, I, I think that's that's another excellent point, is that, you know, you might be able to blow up the text, but if you're, like, on the Coursera, in order to find the help button, you scroll to the very bottom, and it's this little tiny thing, and then you go into there, and then you find, you can't search, like, Coursera demo. Nothing comes up if you do a Google search of that. And so, yeah, making sure that icons are big and, like, why not put a big help thing on the right-hand corner that's the first thing you see in a big button, you know? Why not make things so that, because everyone will benefit from that. So, all right, yeah. From, from this morning, it's all about the design of, of, basically, it's the web design at the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So what about the buttons? We still... Um, Technology is still supposing this is for young people, but it is not. Mm -hmm. It's for it has to be consistent over the whole life cycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess when people, though, when the designers' visions themselves start to go, or when they start having these issues, or if someone has some experience with older parents, that they might have that in mind. But we all really should. Um, because it just, you know, what Pat was saying when she was saying, this isn't made for me, like, that was a really stigmatizing experience for her to go, you know, there's just no one thought about this. No one thought about it. It's, it's hearing loss. It's something that happens to so many people as they get older, you know, and so to have that experience already, you know, by losing your hearing, you get left out of so many conversations. You get left out of so much, you know. There's connections between hearing loss and depression, between hearing loss and cognitive issues. And so if everywhere you turn, including this, like, inclusive idea of, of providing universal education has that as a barrier, it's really problematic. Yeah. Accessibility for MOOCs. I mean, we have this topic of accessibility in the, in the web community, but it's still missing in here. MOOCs, definitely. Okay. Well, I hope you guys all got some good stuff to take away and take back to your respective places. And thank you so much for coming. This was great. Thank you.